panel on globalizing the Greek Turkish 1922 displacements. It's uh, obviously the centenary year of the uh, Treaty of Lausanne and the great population transfers at occasion. Uh, a treaty and a set of transfers which also became precedents, legal and political precedents for subsequent population movements in different parts of the world, uh, from South Asia, between India and Pakistan, uh, to Palestine and much beyond. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have with us uh, three speakers uh, speaking in reverse order to their listing or their announcement. Uh, so first we have Georgios Giannakopoulos from City University of London, uh, and I'll give okay. the briefest of all introductions, just the names and their affiliations, uh, followed by Matthew Frank from the University of Leeds, and Marilena Anastopoulou from here, from Oxford, from Pembroke College. They each speak for about 15 minutes uh, each, and then we will um, open up for discussion with the audience. Uh, so, Georges, you want to begin? Yes. Well, thank you, Faisal, for, for the introduction, and, and many thanks to Autumn and, and the Center for hosting this event and uh, giving us an opportunity to discuss and rethink this moment. What I'm going to do today is just give you a couple of fragmentary thoughts on how we can think about the events in Anatolia in a global frame. And my perspective here is I'm an international historian, and I work kind of on the period of Greece and Southeastern Europe, and I'm currently finishing a book project on British internationalism and questions of imperial order in Southeastern Europe. Uh, and that's how I come into this discussion. And predictably, some of my uh, key characters or some of the key characters of the story are Oxford Dons. Slide. And one of them, and I've some, one of them is uh, a figure that is well known to someone and we've talked about him in other uh, events here called Arnold Toynbee. Uh, the author of the study that you see in the slide, um, which is a study that was published in Britain while the Turkish nationalists were marching towards Smyrna uh, in 1922. The Western question in Greece and Turkey was a hybrid blend of travel writing, humanitarian activism, geopolitical commentary, and philosophical reflections on history. One of the many things uh, this book did was that it marked the beginning of uh, the end of a liberal tradition, Victorian, and distinctively Oxonian way to frame the Eastern question as a question of Christian freedom against Muslim despots. And here, what looms does in this kind of framing about uh, the period is E.A. Freeman, the 19th century figure. But here, I do not wish to discuss Toynbee's testimony at great length. I've done it elsewhere. What I want to do is to use this book and this way of thinking about what happens. <laughs> Asia Minor, uh, published a century ago, a book, incidentally, that is still considered to be a reliable and detached account of the problem. I want to teach the, to, to treat this book and this example as a segue into thinking about 1922 in a global frame. Uh, Toynbee, among many others of his generation, understood the crisis of international order in terms of national questions in search for solutions. And Asia Minor became one of the many hotspots in a world unsettled by ethnic conflicts. Uh, how did the, the Smyrna question enter the global uh, time, the, the time, the frame of global politics? This question takes us to the origins of the Greek expansionist project in Asia Minor. Uh, and to begin answering this question and to offer you a bit of context, uh, we must turn back the time to the period of the Balkan Wars. And this is a couple of points uh, on how the expansion to Asia Minor became a policy option for Greek political elites. In order to answer this question or to start thinking about this question, we need to think carefully the period of the Balkan Wars in Macedonia and elsewhere as a period of where we have dislocation of Muslim populations from the Balkans towards Anatolia. Uh, we also need to account for systematic persecutions of Orthodox populations in Asia Minor <laughs> before the beginning of the First World War. Uh, and we cannot start thinking about this story without understanding 
the role of geopolitics in the beginning of the war in terms of British and French territorial offers to different Balkan member states as a means to get them to enter the war on the side of the Antant. And I would argue this is how kind of Greek expansionism in Asia Minor becomes a policy option. And there's a big question, and there's a question that's being discussed by uh, Greek scholars. Um, to what extent was the Greek expansionist project an effort to protect Greek Orthodox populations? To what extent it was uh, an imperialist venture? Or how do we understand the imperial dimension of it? And these are open questions in research. I just want to flag them to kind of give you a sense of how what the, the project of Greek expansion in Asia Minor, the Smyrna question comes into being. Uh, and moving on, how did experts, and, and this is actually, before we move, move on, this is how uh, the Greek uh, political figure of the time, someone that Michael Renan Smith has written a biography of, uh, Venizelos, uh, understands uh, the discussions in early 1915 about Greek expansionism. And what I have done in this slide, I just want to give you a sense is on the one end, you find a depiction from, I think it's the Punch magazine of Venizelos standing next to Kerensky, a figure that uh, really went unnoticed, it didn't last for long anyway. Uh, and he was that both of them are somewhat the liberation, the harbingers of a new Europe, harbingers. And, and, and the, on, the, on, the, on the quote that I will not read, we find the sense of how Venizelos understands what the Greek expansionist project is about. Uh, but aside from the Greek political elite, uh, how did experts, how did advisors make sense of this being a question during the First World War and during the subsequent war in Anatolia 1919-22? And I would like to tell you here that I mentioned earlier is an interesting source for this. I'm not going to read, especially you can also see the small letters there. I'm just going to give you the check. 1915, Toroidi argues that the destruction of a cosmopolitan community, Smyrna, uh, for it to be annexed with the Hellenic kingdom, doesn't make economic sense. That's 1915, early in the war. 1919, Toroidi finds himself in the Paris Peace Conference and advises the delegation. And there he writes that the Greeks of Constantinople could be separated territorially easier without economic injury, more easier than the Greeks living in Spain. Uh, and moving on, what's interesting is during the first war, during the Greek Turkish war, uh, and it's not only one figure, there's a lot of discussions within the Greek, within the British political kind of establishment, commentators, policy, for, policy, well, foreign policy makers about how to settle, again, a frame, this, the, this being a question as a problem that is in search of a solution. And what, and, and, and so the solution comes into mind, though it's a bit too late to be implemented. And this is to grant the region an autonomous status under some international guarantee, um, with the League of Nations playing a certain role. Or, and that's the interesting bit, that connects with Matthew's work, or uh, place the region in Turkish sovereignty, make the region part of a certain, of a, of a, of a Turkish sovereign state, and exchange populations as a means to guarantee the security of the populations living in the region. And these are kind of experimentations and thinking about a regional kind of uh, a problem that is in search for a solution. What kind of considerations determine the logic of these plans? economic security, protection of human lives, and crucially, I would argue, the um, kind of maintenance of global imperial order. We can move to the next slide. And as this slide shows, and this is from 1920, uh, one of these kind of sometimes dry diplomatic correspondence, but to me, this kind of brings in an interesting perspective into a wider set of discussions at the moment, and I'll read it. Uh, the High Commissioner in Istanbul writes to the British ambassador in, London, in Athens, I cannot but think that a renewal of the Greek advance after the signature of the peace in Seville would much discredit our prestige in the Muslim world and would be used against us by the enemies as a sign that we intend to make no peace with Islam. This is in response to projects 
that the Greek uh, that the Greeks will extend their zone of influence outside its limits. Um, now, uh, another way of thinking about the global frame of the Greek Turkish war is to place it in the wider context of imperial transitions, dissolutions, and transformations across Europe. Uh, and this is just an exercise in documenting what happened in the period we're talking about. And again, I don't want to kind of, you know, overflow you with different kinds of events, but I just find it a useful lens to kind of open up a bit the perspective and think what else is going on in the world in this period, 1919, 1922, that actually allows us to think of broader dynamics. Uh, I'm not going to read all these little things here, just to flag, you know, crisis of imperial rule in different parts of the Ottoman Empire, uh, the creation of new dominions within Britain, but also the formal uh, kind of, you know, uh, coming together of new states like the USSR. And if we can move on, uh, conferences to do with matters of global security. Some are actually successful, Washington Conference in the Pacific, others are not that successful. And then also what I would call unholy alliances. And it's quite interesting to note that, and this all things go on in 1922, uh, you know, a certain, I'd say, um, uh, kind of shifting of the tectonic shifts of, of international politics. Uh, some of those events have been discussed plenty, such as the nation, other less the angle of Turkish Soviet relations, for instance. Now, a global perspective of the Greek Greek Turkish moment offers a connective and comparative account of key themes nested in imperial, international, and internationalist, national, and internationalist imaginaries of a disrupted world in flux. And an example here, moving on, would be also to think about national questions that are not happening in, a, in the Near East. For instance, the Irish question and how the Irish question holds, you know, in the minds of those who write about these events. I'm not going to read this long excerpt, or I'll leave it for you there, but uh, Tony, for instance, establishes the connection between Ireland and the Near East in terms of moral balkanization. The idea is that what the Near East, the violence the Near East does is that it accentuates in some way the violence defined in Western Europe. Now, all these are questionable assumptions. Uh, what we have here is an iteration of the myth, I would argue, of Western homogenization, the idea that problems of ethnic heterogeneity and states of separation are acute in the East, be it Eastern Europe or the Near Middle East. But the Irish question here, a discussion on the Irish question, destabilizes, I would argue, such violence. And now, as I move on to the kind of four or five minutes I have left, I'd like to kind of shift, use the problem of homogeneity to discuss Lausanne as we move on from 1922 to 1923 and from 2022 to 2023. The Lausanne Treaty, I'd argue, was the logical conclusion of in the new Paris Geneva based international system. This is something that Eric Weiss has written about, written about and I can't agree with it. It wasn't the Lausanne, wasn't a departure from the Geneva Paris based system. Indeed, Lausanne comes here to revise the treaty, but I think it would be more useful if you think about it as the kind of conclusion of these politics, new politics of territoriality that are at play. Um, what you will see in the next slide is what I would call the three registers of Lausanne and their representatives. The humanitarian frame, or quasi-humanitarian, we can discuss the, the limits of humanitarianism, represented by Nansen, who interestingly fixes refugees into New Babylon. Right? There's an interesting, there's a lot of new scholarship on Nansen now that kind of casts a more critical shadow. Uh, the Imperial Register of Lausanne, the one who presides the conference, is Lord Kerzon. And we should not forget that Kerzon is the architect of the partition of Bengal. So what we have in mind in Kerzon's thinking is a very imperial and 19th century way of managing international politics. Um, and interestingly, Kerzon is, and between those, Nansen and Kerzon, the terms unmixing comes into the field. Some attribute the, 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 the term to Nansen, others to Kerzon, it's quite interesting. Um, and also we have the Nationalist Register, the Regionalist Nationalist Register, Venizelos in Nanu, representing 
the kind of states that seek to find the permanent solution to their troubles. And the Lausanne moment, I argue, is cycled, elevated, and enshrined into legal norms, 19th century solutions to regional national questions and problems of imperial order. Solutions based on the dislocation of populations. We know how about during the Balkan Wars in the summer of 1914, political elites in Greece, Bulgaria, and Turkey exchanged or contemplated mutual exchanges of populations. But what I find when surveying debates on national questions in Bosnia and Herzegovina, for instance, in Armenia, in Crete, in Macedonia earlier, is a persistent practical argument for the protection of minorities by means of their forcible and or voluntary transfer. And this is an interesting continuity, I think, that, that one should highlight. But the population exchange also had an eventful aftermath. As Matthew's work, among others, has shown, it functions as a template, functions as a template, as a success story for the solutions of minority problems <coughs> moving forward. If we can switch the slide. Uh, and I'm coming kind of quickly to wrap up. Uh, and this is an extract from uh, Toynbee, 1926. He writes one of the first books of introducing modern Turkey to a British audience. And here is how he understands the consequences of the population change. Turkey was now transformed, he writes, into a homogeneous national state. And the way was clear for national development without hindrance from within. <laughs> it's a very interesting liberal defense of population exchanges as a means of sustaining and creating order. And I'm not the only one saying that Matthew's work has said that in maps. Now, a solution, population exchange, validated by the successful incorporation of the refugees in the Greek state and the rapprochement between the Greek Turkish governments in the early 1930s, which put an end earlier, I can't that day, put an end to any hopes for compensation for the loss of properties and, 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 and livelihoods. Far from instruments in international politics or pawns in domestic politics, the refugees who crossed the Aegean in 1923, and those many more who were forced to dislocate earlier in the war, had their own complicated subjectivities, refusing to be bundled into one homogeneous refugee identity. And Marilena will speak to these dimensions later. There is more to be said about the international politics of humanitarianism in Greece in the 1920s, but we could discuss that later. Uh, coming to an end, as I began, I actually want to acknowledge here the presence of Michael, Michael Rennie Smith, who's written an excellent book uh, trying to understand the kind of political reasoning of the Greek expansionism. But I also want to bring your attention to another Oxford-based scholar. Uh, uh, and I want to shift from kind of the male early 20th century classicist type <laughs> who ruled or wished to rule the world uh, to a much more critical turn, which also reflects the scholarship to uh, a more critical social anthropological turn of the 1960s and 70s and onwards, who used tools of the social science and cultural history to unlock the experience of refugeedom. And here what I find in Renee's uh, Rene Houston's really two celebrated books, among other things, is very, it's a very interesting segue to discussing the scholarship of this particular moment when it comes not to international politics, but to things to do with refugee memory, with the social identity of refugee movements. And Rene's work has laid the groundwork for an abundance of studies exploring questions of memory and belonging and the social history of refugee and displaced population is recently coming back to into fashion, I would argue. Rene has also been at the forefront of the emergence of a transnational wave of scholarship on Greece, Turkey, and Lausanne in the early 2000s, publishing, pushing against the prevalence of nationalist historiographies. But now I would argue we're at the moment where this kind of wave <laughs> seems to have faded a little bit. And, we, and the kind of new narratives that we get about Lausanne that don't have this kind of international, transnational kind of push that they had in the early 2000s. Um, and one question I'd be curious to know is how much, and we can discuss that maybe later, Renee, how much input these kinds of studies have 
into practical politics today. We know or we can reconstruct the input that people like Toyin behind, right? Back in the day when they write memoranda, they would inform policy making. But I would argue these kinds of works also have their own inputs that is really interesting to think about. Um, and coming to a conclusion, I realize I must have taken one more minute. Uh, what I try to do in this presentation is just to offer some fragmentary reflections on how the international history of the Greek Turkish war in Anatolia can be placed in a global frame and give you some dimensions. Um, and to end on a kind of more abstract note, a first step in this direction requires the willingness, I would argue, to acknowledge the unique blend of imperial, nationalist, and internationalist imaginaries framing the conclusion of a decade of violence and of a period of, of territorial politics. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Matt. Right. Uh, well, thanks for that. There's lots, uh, lots to talk about there. And it's going to be an interesting and to the discussion uh, at the end. Um, so I'm, I'm delighted to be here in, in Oxford. Uh, it's been a while since I've been back. I actually did my PhD here uh, about, so about 20 years ago. Um, so thanks to Georgius for um, uh, organising this um, and for the European Studies Centre um, uh, for hosting it and Faisal for uh, sharing it. Uh, before I, I, I talk about um, how Lausanne shaped international thinking and policy towards minorities in the 20th century, which is the main focus of my, my paper and the work that uh, uh, George has very generously uh, cited there, I, I do want to begin with a couple of reminiscences, uh, particularly because there's someone in the audience here who is actually uh, brings back to memories of a conference uh, 20 years ago. Was that right, Rene? Yeah. So, yeah, 20 years ago, I think, uh, crossing the Aegean, uh, or, or the conference that resulted in crossing the Aegean, and at that time uh, I just started my uh, started my PhD, um, and I came to the conference, I just uh, given my first ever uh, seminar paper uh, as a postgraduate student uh, on, by coincidence, uh, Lausanne and population exchange. Um, let me say it was, um, it was received politely uh, mm -hmm. at that particular point in time, uh, okay. Okay. Um, and uh, I, I won't be uh, reprising it again today, uh, you'll be glad to know. Um, while we're on the subject of anniversaries, Fines has already pointed out the centenary yeah, of Lausanne, uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the conference and the convention within it, um, and also the uh, centenary of the so-called uh, Major Minor Disaster, um, which necessitated that decision. So I thought we'd start with uh, a round of uh, what happened 100 years ago today. Yeah. Um, so imagine it's November the 15th, 1922. Yeah. Uh, the Lausanne conference will open at the hotel uh, the Chateau at uh, Ushi on Lake Le Mans in uh, five days' time. Delegates are already gathering or making their way there, also nearby Geneva. Among them is the Norwegian scientist explorer turned international civil servant Fridjof Nansen. He's just returned on the Orient Express after a failed six week mission to the Near East. He'd been tasked by the League of Nations in his capacity as High Commissioner for Refugees to broker a preliminary agreement the Turkish nationalists and Greek governments for an exchange of population. At this point, diplomatic wise buzz with chatter about Nansen's failure and his humiliation at the hands of the Turks. Nansen just submitted uh, to the League a report on his trip and together with his assistant, Phil Noel Baker, he's still trying to drum up support for the idea of a population exchange. But 100 years ago this day, 15th of November 1922, the idea of a population exchange seems dead in the water. It's not even on the original agenda of the Lausanne Conference. But in just over two months, Greece and Turkey will have signed the Lausanne Convention, providing for the compulsory exchange of the Greek Orthodox population of Turkey and the Muslim population of Greece, with exceptions for Western Thrace, Constantinople, as it's still known, and some Aegean Islands. The convention also provides for the creation of a mixed commission comprised of equal numbers of Greek, Turkish, and neutral members to oversee the movement and also their indemnification. So 1.2 million Orthodox Greeks and 400,000 Muslims will be covered by the agreement. How the idea of a population exchange went from being a distant prospect <laughs> in mid November 1922 to being enshrined in a groundbreaking international agreement is a story that is well documented and has been extensively recounted even if certain misconceptions about the origin of the proposal, especially the compulsory element, still remain. 
Suffice to say that for a number of reasons, uh, not least the fact that all parties saw advantages in securing a deal, at that juncture and on those terms, it was possible to reach an agreement on this issue, but it was hard to get a on much else at those out in late 22, early 23. Now the convention uh, was roundly condemned at the time, even by the very people negotiating. Lord Curzon, who uh, uh, George has mentioned, the British chairman of the conference, famously called it a thoroughly bad and vicious solution for which the world would pay a heavy, heavy penalty for a hundred years to come, end quote. And claimed, quote, he detested having anything to do with this, end quote. But even before the convention was signed, attention was shifting away from the terrible conditions that had necessitated a compulsory exchange towards a more hopeful glance at the benefits it might bring in the future. While condemning compulsory exchange, Curzon also hoped that the wickedness of the agreement and the suffering that would inevitably accompany it would be, quote, compensated by the removal of deep rooted causes of quarrel and greater homogeneity of population, end quote, which would bring lasting results and, quote, unquote, pacification of What remains of my lot of time uh, today, I'd like to focus on this aspect um, of Lausanne, namely our assessments of the Lausanne Convention significantly shifted over the course of the 1920s. How, in other words, the wider international reaction to Lausanne went from condemnation to admiration to emulation, and what this says about approaches to managing minorities uh, in the 20th century. I suggest the three key developments or radical transformations in the decade or so after Lausanne that helped reshape assessments of the convention and views of the events in the sense. The first of these is the radical transformation of both Greece and Turkey as a result of the mass movement of population in and out of these countries. The transformation was, of course, above all demographic. The proportion of minorities in both countries fell dramatically. Resettlement of co-nationals allowed for the consolidation of the territory of the nation state. Perhaps could finish the conquest of Anatolia, in other words, in the same way that Greece could uh, its new territory of Macedonia. But these changes in population were also a spur to the wider development and modernization of these countries. In the case of Greece, with the assistance of the international community in the form of the Greek settlement commissions and the loans it administered and technical assistance it provided. This international system was in itself an innovation and came to be regarded as a positive feature. The involvement of the League and other outlets showing that, in the words of the League, quote, a scientific handling of a migration problem, end quote, was possible with sufficient international commitment, assistance, and resources. And because of international involvement, there was also a considerable amount of attention paid to and interest in the innovations being undertaken in this part of the world and by association with the events that have prompted mainly the population exchange. If anything, the transformation of Turkey post Lausanne into a modern secular nation state under Kemal was even more striking. During my five years in Turkey, wrote the French journalist Paul Jean in 1929, the past has been swept away. A whole people, if one can say this, has shed its skin. Turkey is free, independent. It is entitled to be called a civilized power. The French Orientalists take a remark as early as 1925. That is the consequence of the Turk of Lausanne. The second radical transformation was diplomatic and was made possible by the first. Following um, Eleftherios of Venizelos' return to power uh, and two years of difficult negotiations, Greece and Turkey signed a series of accords in October 1930 known as the Ankara Agreements, which included a pact of friendship. These saw both sides renounce any further financial claims on each other's. Uh, each other in relation to population exchange and led to the eventual liquidation of the mixed commission. With their efforts, both Venezuelos and Kamal were lauded internationally as visionary states ranking alongside their Western European counterparts, Spezaman and beyond, who by the late 1920s were also working for rapprochement and greater European wide cooperation. The Ankara Agreements were the first stage in a diplomatic revolution in Greek or Turkish relations, continued even after Venezuela's lost power in 1932. Greek or Turkish detente soon led to Entente, a more comprehensive friendship treaty was signed in 1933. And Turkey was also integrated or reintegrated into the international community. In July 1932, Turkey joined the League of Nations. And in February 1934, Greece and Turkey, together with Yugoslavia, 
and Romania signed the Balkan, which pledged them to uphold the territorial status quo in the region and constituted a renunciation of any claims to change status quo. And the lesson to be drawn from this, quote, only through the exchange of minorities could a new Turco Turkish Greek relationship be created, end quote. The Korean and German mm -hmm. Near East specialist Ernst Yeh later wrote. Lausanne was proof that, once free from, harmful from a harmful irredentist embrace, historic enemies could become good neighbors, allies, even soulmates. As the Turkish foreign minister, Rushdul Aras, told Yeh, Greek the Turkish alliance was, quote, friendship. A uh, uh, relationship, not a friendship, but of love. And the third development uh, is the transformation of the wider context of the minorities' problem in Europe and the contrast there with Greece and Turkey. In contrast to the Near East, where 1930 was a sort of Annus Morabilis in Greek or Turkish relations, heralding a new era of peace, cooperation, and stability in the region, in Central and Eastern Europe, they saw the beginning of a decade in which minorities came to be regarded as an increasingly disruptive and ultimately destructive force in international politics. During the 1920s, the minorities question had not been the cause of a systemic international crisis outside of the Near East. Periodically, minorities' questions had resulted in localized bilateral disputes, but no more than this. Thanks above all to the relative self-restraint of states, relative that is to what followed, an international system of minorities' protection, which had been introduced into much of the New Europe with the peace treaties of 1919, held up well, despite the lingering dissatisfaction of states subject to these minority treaties and of those who cast themselves as defending the rights of them. Indeed, the most egregious abuse of minority rights in the 1920s uh, occurred in, in European states not covered by the minority treaties, such as Italy. Uh, and this was seemingly proof of their utility, effectiveness, and the need for a more universal application of the system. By the end of the 1920s, however, the minorities' question was fast becoming a minorities' problem. No matter this minorities' problem was as much a symptom as a cause of the deteriorating, deteriorating international situation, or that by 1934, with the Polish abrogation of its minority treaty, the whole system of international protection was effectively dead. Henceforth, the 15-year experiment in managing minorities through international protection was understood to have contributed to problematizing minorities as an international issue. Revisionist states have been given a forum to air grievances in Geneva, where these became unnecessarily amplified. Minorities have been discouraged from settling down into a constructive relationship with new states of Central Eastern Europe, and instead become a permanent source of national and international instability. In a Europe that by the 1930s was short on political positives, the Near East then represented the closest thing that the post-First World World Settlement had to a success story. Any of the deeper and more troubling implications of the Greek Turkish population exchange were less obvious and indeed less compelling than the concrete political results that it produced in interstate relations. On the occasion of the winding up of the mixed commission in 1934, the French ambassador in Ankara, Albert Camara, neatly summed up the emerging international consensus in Lausanne and its lessons on that quote. On the whole, one can be pleased with the satisfactory liquidation of the formidable problem of the Greek minority, which poisoned for a century relations between the two nations, and whose settlement through an exchange of population, criticised at the time of the signing by some humanitarian grounds, has opened the way to Greek and Turkish friendship of today. Unpleasant from a humane point of view and economically harmful, the exchange of population is critically beneficial. But this is the opinion of the Turks, who, delighting at having made a clean sweep of the past, compare Turkey to Bay Turkish with European states troubled by dangerous minority disputes. Comparisons came from the other direction as well. All foreign observers of the Near East were struck by the transformative impact the removal of minorities had had on the internal structure and development of Turkey and Greece, and more crucially, its soothing effect on relations between the two states. The lessening of tensions between these historic enemies and the first signs of rapprochement meant that admirations soon spilled over into emulation. The Greek and Turkish model of managing minorities emerged, and by the late 1930s, it had already been introduced into the heart of Central Europe. The subsequent adoption of the principle of population transfer by the European dictatorships, German, Italian, and Soviet, was motivated by the same considerations of state and diplomacy that lay behind the Greek and Turkish exchange. As alliances were formed, cemented, and broken, the minorities became the currency in which these deals were transacted. 
It would be inaccurate to claim that Lausanne served as a precedent in a legal or technical sense for these so-called Heinzweig transfers of around 500,000 ethnic Germans between 1939 and 41 in Nazi-dominated Europe. Neither the Germans, nor Italians, nor the Soviets studied the Greco-Turkish exchange in the way that the Western Allies and exile governments would during the Second World War. Nevertheless, for European dictatorships and for fascism in Italy in particular, this early attempt, or the early attempt by Western democracies to help solve a minority problem through bilateral agreements for mass resettlement, was an obvious point of reference, a political precedent which served as an inspiration and by extension a justification of actions taking the highest levels of state between the Axis powers, large and small. Indeed, European dictatorships used the same vocabulary and arguments in support of population transfer as Western democracies had in the 1920s, resettling minorities to safeguard them from the worst fate, to improve bilateral relations with neighboring states and serve the cause of wider European peace and stability. Even more so for the Axis powers, the Greek and Turkish exchange was an instructive president the Allies during the immediately after the Second World War. And it's on this point that I would like to end with an observation about the significance of the Greek and Turkish exchange and the Lausanne model in framing debate and policy around the place of minorities in the mid-1940s when, when the principle of the Venice the Senate. While it's true that the Allied governments and agencies involved in post-war planning did study the Greek and Turkish exchange in some detail and discourse on the minorities problem at the time was peppered with references to it, in reality, it provided no more of a technical or practical guide or legal precedent for the Allies than a half of the Axis powers. Its importance was again primarily political, for the way it supported a particular reading of the minorities problem, problems of Europe, and how, at least when it came to dealing with certain minority groups, this might be solved and justified. The Axis powers themselves appropriated the language and arguments of those was therefore a gift to the Allies especially when it came to discussing and then justifying the decision to remove those remaining German minorities and those who would end up as minorities in post-war East Central Europe, all 10 to 12 million of them. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentations. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you all for being here. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to have Michael Wayne Smith and Renee Hirson among us for our key figures and very important scholars. Renee, you're my most quoted author in my deeply research. So it's a great pleasure to have you around. Um, so in this presentation, I'm exploring the attitudes of those who were refugees in the past, who were refugees in the present. Uh, are these people more sympathetic or more hostile? Uh, to subsequent waves of migrants. In this presentation, I will guide you uh, through this question, briefly overviewing the historical context, uh, the conceptual tools, and the methodological tools, and then make some of my key findings. Uh, this research derives from my different research titled Coming to Terms with Forced Migration, an intergenerational study of Asian minor refugee memory in Greece which is a comparative intergenerational and interregional history of Asian minor memories and identities of forced displacement that examines this multi-layered relationship between contemporary attitudes and refugee past. Um, in 2015, during uh, Europe's migration crisis, the Greek island of Lesbos became a symbol of hospitality worldwide and hosting vast numbers of displaced people. At the same time, the island's residents were emphasizing their own refugee identity, explaining to me that their parents were refugees from Turkey, and this is why they feel sympathy towards the newcomers. What is so striking about Lesbos is that it hosts significant contemporary migration, while at the same time, a large part of its population descends from refugees from Asia Minor, what we're discussing previously. In Greece, though, the case of Lesbos is far from rare. In 1923, uh, Greece and Turkey agreed to the compulsory exchange of populations of the religious minority, a story which is central to the Greek identity and poses international interest since it was the first uh, compulsory population exchange in history. Uh, in this context, it comes into question 
lot of memories of the 1922-24 forced displacement seems over time uh, from one generation to the next. And how do people with these memories and identities think about subsequent migration? Facing uh, refugee memories and identities, I collected archival evidence, uh, 5,000 oral testimonies, and I conducted over 260 interviews. The oral history approach enabled me to provide a diverse account of Asia Minor refugee memory, talking to people and tracing their voices. I also followed a regional history approach. You can see there the specific locations in the map, uh, focusing on three geographic areas across Greece, namely the borderline island of Lesbos, Central Macedonia, Northern Greece, and Attica. So the conceptual tools of this research are memory and identity. I look at individual, collective, and public memories of forced displacement. However, given that trauma is both the event, uh, but also the memory of the event, I also examine refugee memory uh, as experienced through its transfer from the first generation with a direct experience, to the following generations, their children, grandchildren. Um, I looked into four generations uh, of Asian minor refugee descendants. So memory and identity construct each other and are saved and reshaped across different historical periods for related age groups embedded in uh, social historical processes. So in this case, from science to latency and ultimately a reawakening, Intergenerational refugee memory and identity pass through the different stages of trauma and change throughout different historical periods. Asia Minor refugee identity is formed through the coexistence of different particularities. We have historical, religious, linguistic, and cultural uh, particularities and their formation and reformation over time. Overall, for the first two generations, Asia Minor refugee identity becomes a refugee uh, being isolated in the private, private sphere, in the family sphere mostly. And um, it is gradually transformed into a citizen entering the public life for the third and the fourth generation. Reflecting on sharp changes of these, uh, uh, reflecting on these sharp changes, um, Vasos Boyadoglu, born in 1935, described the transmutation of his identity over time. He contrasted his early ways to hide his family name because of his embarrassment of the patronymic suffix Oglu uh, that declares Asia Minor ancestry to his current pride about his refugee identity. So he noted, and I quote, when I was a kid at school, I used to mutter my last name. I was ashamed to say Oglu. Now I'm proud of it. Uh, how do people with memories and identities placement think about such a migration? Are they becoming <clears throat> empathizers, antagonists, or rivals? Um, in, this in the context of this presentation, I will examine um, attitudes in relation to uh, post-2015 uh, migrations uh, through the potential outcomes of empathy, hostility, and competitive victimization. Let's examine three very brief quotes. So firstly, Konstantinos Fotiadis was born in 1948 in an almost exclusively uh, convict village in central Macedonia. The defining characteristics of his refugee identity, rooted in historical, religious, um, cultural elements, become an identity scene uh, against the other. And in this case, the other is the other waves of, of migrants. For Constantinos, these elements form a community of value and lead to hierarchies of acceptability. Constantinos said, and I quote, with the Syrians, there is a common solidarity. I may have never existed if they didn't give a piece of bread to my grandfather at the time. I'm very positive about the Syrian refugees uh, uh, from Syria because it is a time for us to return to hospitality. And I said, about the refugees, yes, let's accept them. Greece does not need any more economic migrants. I fear only the Pakistanis and the Afghans. 
there. The main difficulties are Islamic fanaticism. There is a plan to make Greece masculine. So particularities of Central Macedonia's regional history lead to compassion and historical parallels towards Syrian refugees who are linked to descendants' own history of forced displacement. And on the other hand, we can see hierarchies of acceptability that are created based on binary distinctions between who is a migrant and who is a refugee, and seek a community of value in which characteristics such as religion, as we saw, uh, play a key role in the acceptance or the rejection of an ethnic outgroup in the whole society. On the other hand, Eralius Panelli uh, was born in 1965 on the borderland island of Lesbos that constitutes an entry port, a transit point, and a place of settlement for significant past as well as contemporary uh, migratory waves. Eralius paralleled the contemporary displacement with her family history of displacement and migration, overcoming these uh, binary distinctions between migrants and refugees, and mentioning that. At the beginning, it was the Syrians. We felt sorry for them because they had a life built and those people were forced to live. They reminded me, you know, of all the Smyrnians. The first of all, were refugee flows. We believed it and we felt we have many things in common with these people. These following flows were not refugee flows, but rather economic migrants. And with this, we have a part, the Greeks. Greeks have many economic migrants. And I too have my aunt who is an economic migrant in the USA. And all, of, uh, family have, all families have economic migrants abroad. Lastly, uh, Anastasis Haralabopoulos was born in 1919. Uh, so we started with a descendant of the second generation, then moved uh, on to a descendant of the third generation. And now we have a descendant of the fourth generation. Uh, she was born in a formerly uh, known refugee settlement in Athens. Anastasis finally different stories of displacement, referring to the circularity uh, of integration processes and the, the interchanging idea of the established and the outsider. Anastasis said, I believe that in 10 years, they would have been fully integrated, as was the case with the Albanians. When the Greeks came here, they were exalted. When the Albanians came, they were exalted. Now, they, contemporary migrants, come and they, the established population, insult them again. I believe that wherever people go, there will be the same treatment. But I believe that if you look at it historically, populations are constantly moving here uh, and there. So this research includes multiple connected and disconnected life histories of Asia Minor refugees and their descendants uh, that have not been part of the broader Asia Minor account. So these stories derive from uh, refugees from different places of origin, Asia Minor origin, different generations, different uh, geographical locations, providing, providing as a known story of the refugee memory and identity, uh, as well as the ways they inform attitudes. Without ignoring the multiplicity of variables in play, I argue that refugee, um, Asia Minor refugee history, memory, and identity acquired various meanings and interpretations, influencing descendants' attitudes in often conflicting ways. So refugee identity is a capacious and dynamic platform of ongoing understanding, as well as a limited space of domination and competition. This uh, uh, contention is situated at the heart of this resistance, leading both to the building of bridges with histories of others and historical parallels, but also to their demolitions through hierarchies of acceptability and antagonistic comparisons. These emerging complexities remind us that it, it is unwise to overgeneralize about attitudes towards migration that can be actually quite volatile, but also contradictory. Uh, describing this complexity, one, one of my interviewees confessed, and I quote, I don't know which are the opposing sides, because sometimes I don't know what side I'm on. In the morning, I sympathize. I'm with them. At 10, I detest them. At 12, I save them. At 3, I hate them. At 7, 
I have to do something for them and I do it. At 10, I cannot stand them. Because you can see we have this contestation here. Elucidating uh, the attitudes of refugee descendants, I bring together time, generations, place, uh, geographies, and subsequent migration, waves of other migrants. I argue that the intersection of these three elements allow us an understanding of the continuities and discontinuities that characterize the genus based attitudes of refugee descendants leading to empathy, hostility, and competition. It seems that geography matters as regional and historical particularities inform elements such as the existence of different senses of refugee identity and the varying degrees of exposure, of course, to subsequent migration. And also generation matters as different generations express different attitudes based on their varying levels uh, of integration and the diverse intensities of their refugee identities. Overall, lesbians are presented as gate owners, Macedonians as gatekeepers, and Athenians as pragmatists, uh, being in between of the genus phase reactions. Using Denis, uh, the god of gates and transitions, beginnings and endings, to parallel its generation, the second, the second generation sees into the refugee past with one face, and the fourth generation into the refugee future with the other face, leaving the third generation in the middle of this fluid duality. Many facets of the compulsory population exchange have become central to various studies. This work offers an intergenerational and interregional uh, and comparative understanding, illuminating memories and identities of forced displacement among Asian minor refugees and, the, and their descendants in the context of subsequent migration. Uh, the year 2023 and 2002 are the centenary of the Asian minor uh, expulsion that mark the establishment of population transfers and displacements throughout the world. So many examples compose the unsettling of the modern world uh, through different historical periods and regions such as Central and Southeastern Europe, South Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. So the circularity that migration history in case uh, can be expressed with very similar and op opposite patterns, uh, connected and disconnected stories of migration. One of the stories is the history of migration in Greece and its historical parallel, the historical parallel between the Greek Turkish population exchange and the contemporary migration and refugee flows. Today, in light of the current migration and refugee crisis, the critical understanding of past displacements echoes with new relevance. And in this context, further comparative research is needed, and especially bringing together connected and disconnected <coughs> stories migration stories and rethinking population movements and displacements in the long uh, 20th century. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I thought those were really great uh, presentations, all of them. And I have, if I may, a couple of uh, points for each one of the speakers, and then we can open up uh, to questions uh, from the audience. Uh, George, I was thinking, you know, you're speaking about humanitarianism. And, the long history of humanitarian intervention, as it's now known. The connection between that and democratization or democratic representation is an interesting one. Because in your story, you require a humanitarian intervention to make democratic representation possible later. That the humanitarian enterprise itself is undemocratic almost by default. And you see this as an imperial um, practice as early as abolitionism. British abolitionism, you know, where you need to transport ex-slaves to um, uh, Sierra Leone for Britain, Liberia for um, America, uh, and then you can create a democratic society. So the two notions are linked, but there seems to be a kind of temporal gap between them. One justifies the other. Uh, and I was thinking in this 1922 moment, um, What's interesting, and the moment before that you also mentioned the Balkan War, uh, is that when you're looking at um, uh, international Muslim opinion, you spoke of 
European or Christian opinion, but of course there's an international Muslim opinion developing at this moment, especially from a place like India, which has the world's largest Muslim population at the time, you have these two things together. So on the one hand, you have already with the Balkan War, Indian Muslims send a medical mission to Turkey for the Balkan War specifically to work. And they have all of these plans to set up colonies in Anatolia for Turkish refugees from the Balkans uh, who are going to be living in new towns named after Indian towns. Uh, you know, the, the money comes from Indian Muslims. But you also have, by the time the First World War begins, uh, the uh, continuing humanitarian concerns, but now a kind of very new democratic claim, even under situations of colonial rule, which is Indian Muslims saying, we are British subjects, there are a lot of us, uh, and we contributed very greatly to your war effort. Without us, you would not have won this war, certainly in West Virginia, even in certain European theaters. You now owe us uh, that Britain needs to consider the, um, the wishes and the interests of its own subject populations, even before they are able to vote. Uh, so there you have a kind of, if you will, on the other side of the coin, a kind of interesting coming together of the humanitarian principle on the one hand, through the Red Crescent Society. Uh, the British Red Crescent Society is founded in 1911 in London by an Indian Muslim who is a Privy Councilor, uh, so to say, maybe. and it sends the Indian Medical Mission to the Balkans. Um, you know, I wonder if you could you know, speak more broadly about these sort of intertwinements, uh, which, as it were, happen in Europe, but they are mir mirrored and, as it were, mirrored back in, 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 in different shapes um, from other parts of the world. Uh, for Matthew, I just thought it was yeah. I mentioned, of course, for Curzon, George was also mentioned in the idea that an, a, a very prominent imperial administrator, he was after all Viceroy of India, um, should be in the business of making the nation state into a normative political form, uh, or indeed that the great powers, all of whom or most of whom are imperial should throw themselves so wholeheartedly in the making of an apparently homogeneous national form, while their own, as it were, empires are non entirely non-homogeneous, and they struggle against homogeneity. Um, uh, so if you might say something about that contradiction, also it strikes me, again, looking at the other side, how this event and this period, the end of the, of the First World War, and the collapse of three empires, uh, certainly in, in, in Muslim political thought, makes the nation state into a deeply suspect entity. Uh, so that Indian Muslims condemn the Arab revolt and the Arab new nation states, uh, which are of course under British and French uh, dominion, as, as being treacherous uh, to the Muslim world. Uh, and there's a whole history there that begins with a kind of critique of the nation state already with the end of the First World War and the critique of the League of Nations itself. What emerges as a possible model is the USSR as a kind of conjuries of nations that are interdependent. Um, and Marilena, I thought, you know, the, the thing of memory is, you forgive me because I work with India, inevitably I'll break it. <laughs> uh, uh, but also because after all, as we know, in this country, Indians are the, they're not called refugees, they're called overstayers. I mean, the mm -hmm. largest number of um, people without official papers or rights to stay in the United Kingdom are not coming in small boats from uh, across the channel. They've come here with tourist visas or something and they, they never go back. And this is a huge dispute between the government of India and the British government at the moment about returning so it, they're barely visible in the press because they don't come in boats, but in fact, it's the largest number in this country. It's not Syrians or Afghans or Albanians or whatever. So I just thought the, the um, it, if you could say something about the use of terminology even, whether it's from this period and how, how the, on the one hand, the inheritance of terms from say, 
the 1922 period till today. On the other hand, the kind of mixture between them. And I asked because uh, you know, when uh, the partition of India happens in 1947, and in part that exchange of population is doesn't serve as a 1922 does not serve as a legal precedent, but it's certainly a rhetorical. Uh, it provides a rhetorical context for both Jinnah and founder of Pakistan and Ambedkar, the first Indian law minister, talk positively about the Turkish Greek exchange of populations, almost as if going back to Matthew's paper, they think, well, this is, it worked out. Okay, it was terrible, but uh, it worked out. It didn't work out. It worked out even less well for South Asia than it did, if you will, for um, Greece and Turkey, because they had such sort of wars with each other. Uh, other things. But what happens in this period is when you have these large movements of population between India and Pakistan, the UN refuses to recognize them as refugees on the assumption, as with Greece and Turkey, that they each have a country to go to, they, that they are not people without citizenship, uh, whether they've been forced to leave or not. Uh, so that neither India nor Pakistan has subsequently signed the UN Convention on Refugees mm -hmm. as a result. Uh, so, you know, there are other, there are sort of these weird alternative mm -hmm. histories that mm -hmm. come out of that. Mm -hmm. And of course, the refugee population that you're talking about, and it's so interesting how the Syrians, as opposed to the Pakistanis and Afghans, come into the memories of, of these people themselves with Asia Minor origins, is the distinctions of the kind that the UN made uh, in, in, in 48. Um, whether this, these kinds of distinctions <clears throat> have a meaning. This year is also the 50th anniversary of the Uganda crisis, uh, which is the first, as I take it, uh, refugee, except they're not refugees in so many ways, movement of non-Western, non-European, non-white people into certainly Britain, but I imagine Western Europe as a whole. And I question the status refugee because of course they all had British papers, but they're defined as refugees by this government, even though they come as, they don't have to apply for citizenship later, you know, um, they're British subjects for the most part. Uh, and there, the difference of course is as with the Pakistanis, etc., is that they're not, the idea of the refugee return has been broken. It's a return of some kind. Um, they're returning to the country of their citizenship, uh, but they continue being minorities. So it's no longer a change where a minority gets to become a majority on both sides. And do you think that the different kind of history of the figure of the refugee and the kind of to the ambiguous category itself that comes to the I don't know if we want to just open up or if anyone wants to address any of these questions. Okay, so should I quickly? Uh, yeah, and then we can come back to them later, you know. Okay, I'm sure. So, so I, okay, thanks, friends. Okay, very quickly. Uh, thanks. Very interesting question and quite intriguing and difficult to answer. So, just let me make a couple of points about humanitarianism and democracy. Different registers here. One is if one thinks about the management of the crisis within the Greek state in the 20s, and we think of humanitarianism as the League of Nations and other organizations, philanthropic, etc., helping set up the, the, the kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure. It is a story of essentially helping a state in crisis on creating structures whereby populations uh, that didn't necessarily identify themselves as Greek subjects, but obviously they're not stateless, as you said. Uh, are, so it becomes a story where it's international organizations with the League of Nations and various instruments into sustaining a democratic order and making the kind of, you know, living of refugees easier. That's one aspect. Another level which connects more to what you're saying is think about international humanitarianism and empire. One is and the Greeks at the beginning operate under that front, you know, the whole 19th century discussion, but essentially what happens in, 
a very uh, a kind of uh, how to put it like bland view of the Ottoman Empire as a place where Christian minorities were oppressed, right? So there's a certain duty here from humanitarians, I Christian humanitarians, into doing something about that. And this could potentially be the perspective under which people, you know, the prehistory of kind of the nonsense moment, if you will. There's also very, another interesting dimension here, and Toynbee finds himself in that, which is red crescent movements within Turkey during the Greek Turkish War, publicizing atrocities that actually kind of the Greeks conducted there. And that kind of reverses the, you know, the kind of narrative. And that also is part of why that moment becomes politically explosive for Greece. You know, it's being projected in, in the eyes of allies like Britain that essentially, well, Greeks do similar things, though they are the ones who we expected to be more civilized, to put it that way. So that's kind of a couple of points throwing there on the question of humanitarian how it plays out in that moment. Yeah, just a pick thanks for all those points, Faisal. Um, uh, I'll, I'll pick up on the thing, uh, which is your point you made there, interesting that uh, in the Muslim world, in particular, there's distrust of this kind of nation state model, uh, particularly because of the increasing emphasis on homogeneity within it. Now, of course, I, I, and you point out the USR are at this point uh, representing a very different idea of how a state can be constituted. I, I think it's one of the, another of your Oxford Doms actually uh, 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 here, uh, C.A. McCartney, uh, on minorities in the 30s. I think I, I think it's his coinage. He called the USR the unnational state. Yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there are other models on the table. Absolutely. Now the British at this point. I'm really uh, at Paris in 1990. I have no interest in minority protection. What they're interested in is assimilation. The idea that you know these minorities will be assimilated into a larger, yeah, uh, more powerful political and cultural entity. There. Um, so there are other models behind us, yeah, but ways of reconciling um, or, or aligning nation, the nation or nations within the frontiers of the state. The unnational state is one. Assimilation is another. Of course. And a national state is a form of supranationalism. Of course, the British had it themselves by creating Britishness in that respect, you know, creating these identities that go with Yugoslavism, as we didn't see. So there are other models about Some of these are actually prompted because of the extremes to which the national principle had been applied uh, within uh, in post dynastic Europe in the 40 years crisis that we see from the you know, uh, beginning of the First World War and to the early, 19, early 1950s. But I would, what I would point out as well, and, and George will be, will, will, will be better on this than me because he's familiar with all these types of observers. Is that anybody in the know, the expert, will all you know, saying this the, the principle of nationality is ill suited to this part of Europe, yeah. uh, totally ill suited to it. Um, and that this kind of, yeah, this homogenous state, uh, nation state model uh, will always create outsiders. Um, and uh, as a consequence of that, uh, yeah, we need to think of other ways of doing that. And the Soviet Union was that, wasn't it? For some of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's the answer. Thank you. Thank you very much for this great question. I think that it needs to clarify that the term refugee that I'm using uh, does not technically apply to this uh, group of people because they came under the broader framework of the compulsory exchange of populations. And I would quote actually Rene here by saying that. However, and as you suggested, the terms people use to describe themselves are soci sociologically significant and very important. So I would say that the Asian minor refugee identity was composed of what we said, memory of trauma, linguistic particularities, historical particularities, <laughs> cultural particularities. And these particularities uh, were the defining characteristics of the refugee identity, an identity that was adopted on the one hand, um, uh, by this out group, because they wanted to safeguard their identity. And on the other hand, it's how we see an identity in relation or in opposition to the other. And in this case, the other is the established population, uh, the native population who were referring to refugees. So here the connotations matter because the term refugee started by having very negative, strong, strongly negative connotations. And over the years and through their successful integration, there is a sifting narrative. So actually the term refugees acquires very positive connotations in the 
um, sociological imagination and reality uh, of uh, the Greek uh, nation state. And I would say, because I, I did, that was one of my key questions in the field work, how do you identify yourself? And most people were starting by clarifying that they, they still feel refugees. Most of them, they were saying that I'm a refugee too. Uh, uh, I'm an Asian minor refugee, and this is my, uh, the most prominent component of my identification. But then it was interesting to see how different levels of identification play out. Um, the national identity, the regional identity of these, these separate case studies, and also this imagined to an extent identity, the Asian minor refugee identity. And um, depends a lot on the historical context. For example, uh, in the case of Lesbos, uh, the refugee identity was one of the most prominent components on people's reflective self-positioning. If you had to position yourself, you would say, I'm a refugee, no matter the generation or the circumstances of your forced displacement. And, that, and I know that this wasn't the case in two years back. And in the case of Central Macedonia, for example, because of the particularities of the original history, it seems that refugees were put it actually there in order to safeguard, uh, safeguard the country's territorial integrity. And they adopted um, the identity of the guardians of the border. So in this case, the refugee identification comes second, and the national identity seems to be first, um, in, in very simple terms. So I would say that in terms of identification, the circumstances of someone's first settlement, uh, the degree of their integration in the whole society, as well as the different generations of the generational component matters. Thank you very much. Um, questions? Yes. Uh, yes, uh, I'll still all three fascinating uh, presentations and also your probing questions. Um, my question is, um, can you, could you imagine a benevolent unmixing of populations? That's a little cousin phrase, I think, maybe picked up by Churchill and then by Rogers Brubaker when talking about the post-Soviet breakup, unmixing. Would there be a benevolent secession, a benevolent segregation even, a benevolent uh, separation? And the reason I ask that is, well, Marilyn, you might know why I'm asking that, but uh, <coughs> um, the current refugee regime has signally failed, and it's not going to uh, pick up because nation states individually nor collectively are not going to step up to their responsibilities in international law. The three durable solutions, so-called local integration, uh, repatriation and uh, resettlement, hardly deal with, uh, deal with a tiny fraction of the world's refugee population. And, you know, certain Palestinians have been waiting 70 plus years for their situation to resolve. So I'm just wondering if there is any mileage in the notion of unmixing or secession or some kind of self uh, government. Let's <laughs> draw the collective couple when you think yeah. about that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you, all three of you. Really enjoyed that. And I kind of like most of the, the different approaches you had in the problem. It kind of reminds me of the way that you've got international relations and in a sense social history, which is a kind of stroke anthropological perspective from Ray and Dana. And people do the same kind of work in 1918, 1945, and, and uh, 1989. Matthew's done great work in, in the aftermath of 1945. So the question is really for Yorgos, though. Um, I think you're right in terms of thinking about a global 1922 and you talk about Apollo and the kind of Washington conference. I think there's a lot of mileage there, but I was just kind of wondering when you said that at one point you thought that the 1922 Greek uh, Turkish mm -hmm. settlement was the kind of last of the 19th century yes. solution. Not to me, that kind of flies in the face of a lot of literature, Eric Weitz and others that have said that actually what distinguishes 1922, it's a very 20th century idea of the unmixing and that's so different from a 19th century idea of, of uh, kind of imperial model, really in a sense uh, integrating minority. So 
that you pose the question. I'm wondering where you actually stand on it. Is this in a sense the last 19th century diplomatic solution or the beginning of a very different century's idea? As far as I know, Hitler himself actually looked back on on the Greek uh, Turkish settlement is actually kind of a precedent. So that's a particular interpretation. I mean, you cited a number of 30s leaders. So I, do you see this as, the, as part of a long 19th century or the beginning of something very, very different? Uh, Jonathan Shaler. Um, I, as I was listening particularly, I mean, they were all fascinating and complimentary uh, presentations, but as I was listening to Mary Lena, I was struck by the contrasts between refugees and your reference, Chair, to the East African Asians. Uh, and I was particularly struck by the impression that uh, empathy seems to have gone out of the window among certain uh, senior members in this country <laughs> of the uh, refugee population, however you define that. And I, I wonder if, if there were any sort of relationship between that, as, as you've tried also to raise. Um, what determines, uh, and maybe it's a question for Maradona, what really determines the tendency to feel empathy as opposed to the tendency to try to pull up the ladder? Because I have the impression in this country, it's mostly trying to pull up the ladder and it's been exploited in domestic politics. Is that also the case in, in yeah. Greece? Uh, or in the, among, in the refugee population? Sort of ex the former refugee population, but also more generally in the, in the national and the wider population? Yes. Hmm? Yeah. David Mann, thank you. Um, in a way, my question follows from the first one. Um, when they reached the negotiating table in 22, had there been any attempt to try and determine what the people who were going to ex be exchanged thought about it? I think I'll leave your question on one side. There are two things I wanted to make a comment on or ask about. Going back to George's presentation, I've been reading a whole lot of the literature in Asia Minor over the past week. And um, it's quite surprising how much of it comes from non Greek sources. We've heard about some of them, and Rene and the anthropologists and so on. But also, going back to Toynbee, if you think about Toynbee, uh, it had to be somebody who was not Greek, who wrote that book. It couldn't have been done by a Greek, it couldn't have been done by a Turk. Uh, Toynbee was uniquely well-placed to write it. There's quite a lot in his book, which is boring, but the, the bits about the actual campaign are absolutely riveting. And of course, that's what caused the great upsurge of anger in Britain about his book. Um, if one faces the literature further forward, um, sometimes the same sort of phenomenon can be noted, that it's the outsider who does as well or better than the Greeks. And one of the reasons why it's difficult for the Greeks is that if they write about all this, it inevitably turns into a book about the national schism, the Vikas Mos, and it ceases to be straightforward you know, about the Greek and Turkish confrontation. So that, that's a, a sort of comment about that. And I should be writing about this because I'm being asked to do an article about the, the literature uh, for next year. The other thought is um, about risk. And most of what's been said this evening for obvious reasons, quite naturally, has been about the exchange of populations and what happened in late 1922 and 1923 and after. Um, I've been 
working recently on the works of A. A. Pallis, Alexander Anastasios Pallis, um, who had the advantage, this sort of goes back to what I was saying just now in a way, I suppose. He was, he had British nationality. He was brought up in Manchester and Liverpool and Bombay. Um, and he spent time in Egypt working for Throma uh, as a civil servant in Egypt before he came to Macedonia and became heavily involved in the refugee question. And uh, a lot of what he wrote about was not the exchange of populations. Of course, he covered that. But it was the earlier period from 1914 onwards. Uh, and for instance, he wrote a magnificent article called Racial Migrations of the Balkans, which uh, lists uh, meticulously all the exchanges and um, not just the exchanges, but the, uh, the elimination of members of the Macedonian population over the period from 1914 to 1922 and beyond. Uh, and I think he's somebody who's worth some attention. Well, okay, um, what I would like to ask you, I mean, fascinating presentations, uh, well done. Um, I would like you to explain to me this paradox, right? That this was really a national tragedy. Uh, and usually in the, you know, official and collective historical narratives of countries, national uh, tragedies tend to be, you know, downgraded, not remembered so well, uh, you know, uh, and avoid them, um, uh, you know, to put it up. So can you think of other examples where such national tragedies are actually remembered in such vivid colors, you know, like the Greek case. And then you've got the contrast between the Turkish example, where all those exchanges of populations that were happening and for the Turks, they were even more kind of, um, you know, lo much longer in time, but also the numbers were also, also bigger. Uh, these are things that are not commemorated. They're not remembered. <laughs> Turkey actually doesn't deal with them. It's, it's great actually that Rene, and Bruce Clark saw uh, that kind of, um, you know, um, uh, historical moment from, from both perspectives. And you can see really the contrast between the two. Uh, so I would like to, you know, to ask you, how do you explain the fact that in the Greek case, it's so remembered, whether there are any other cases, you know, comparable cases, uh, and, uh, you know, why the kind of Greek Turkish discrepancy as well? Well, thank you for reading all the a wonderful set of questions, um, which I shall leave you to uh, <laughs> respond to. <laughs> Same order or? Answer something quickly. Sure. Yeah. For the back there, benevolent unmixing. Um, depends who's being unmixed, what are we talking about? If it's about secession, then yes, the Velvet Divorce, 1993. Um, uh, Paul's uh, point there about 1922 is an end of an era or the opening of a new one. I really like your idea. Um, is it, I think it's your idea, Georges, about the Lazan moment? Is it your idea? I think so. Yeah, well, no, I don't know. No, 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 if it is. No, no, I'm not doubting it is. I really liked this idea of, uh, of a moment, the three frames, the humanitarian, the imperial, and the national. Um, but I would probably go with what I think opens a new era, yeah, in lots of different ways. One, because, of course, Lausanne is the first revision settlement. It looks ahead to the 30s, yeah, yeah, to new native set and the, the clamour by revision of states. It is because it's tears up separate, isn't it? And that says it looks forward. Uh, and with a strong revisionist power that needs to be dealt with as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Curtin has rings run around him, yeah, yeah, uh, at Lausanne by the, the, the Turkish delegation. I also think as well, uh, one way of explaining the, the reaction that I, I, I mentioned and the condemnation of it is because this is 19th century minds dealing with a 20th century problem. And that in many ways is why, this is, you know, this is an affront to all liberal values, whether it be individual rights, property, yeah, and the sanctity of that. So in many ways, the reaction in many ways is the clash of the two different years. Um, so that's, that's my response to that. The question of were the populations asked? No. This is, this is seeing like a state. This is very much, yes, yeah, so you can, uh, for, uh, this is the you know, state's prerogatives here. Um, and last of all, yeah, um, the, um, 
the, the, the point about communities in other contexts as well, and uh, um, more than me in the German case, most definitely, that you can have a success narrative. You know, the idea that these, particularly in Western Germany, that you know, the, 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 the economic miracle of the 1950s was able to not only to take you know, large numbers of in the 1940s, but then uh, East German refugees in the 1950s. And that wasn't enough as well. They had to have gas arbeiter afterwards too. So this idea that the, the engine of the West German economy, which is the continuity of, of the German, was able to absorb this. So in that sense, it's a success story, less about the, the refugees than about the new uh, 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 West, West, German, West German state. And as Robert Muller's pointed out in his book uh, on, 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 on commemoration in the 1950s, this was an issue that was in the foreground yeah, throughout the 50s, uh, despite what we talk about today. So, no, maybe not as an international focus on that, but very much as an internal national story. It's there as well. And a, um, and a positive story can be told about it in terms of the integration um, and their contribution to, um, uh, uh, to, to, to the German economy and, and politically as well. So, yeah, mm -hmm. those are my short points. Okay. Okay, so, uh, just just to follow up on this, just to disagree with you and Paul slightly on this, which is the, the, the following. What I try to say, what I think is, and I think Eric Weiss is along the lines of what I'm describing now, is that in terms of thinking about the kind of, say, the Lausanne moment as the beginning of something new, I think we need to extend the timeline to the late 19th century and to thinking about minorities and minorities coming to the play of international politics more forcefully in the 1870s, in the 1880s, not, not necessarily with the League of Nations. And one could, and there's work on, on that, stressing kind of the 19th century continues. And what do I mean by this? I mean, we have, in, and I, I would argue, in micro problems, micro sites, not as big as Lausanne, solutions when minorities are involved. Being, being proposed in different in various degrees that mirror what happens in Lausanne. But obviously that takes it to a different, Lausanne takes this to a different level. So I would, I would, I would argue that we have a certain, the emergence of a certain toolkit in thinking about population, transfers and minorities as a way to solve national problems from the late 19th century onwards. But that's not to say that it doesn't become a different matter or a different scale of the problem in the 30s and with a look how do we place Lausanne here indeed it is a, a treaty that revises things but, but the, the point I'm making is that we can also think about it as coming off how about it like digesting certain dynamics with regards to you know uh, how to you know, you know you know certain dynamics in creating a new order that we find the play from the Balkan wars on so I'm not, I'm not negating the forward moment. I'm just saying there's a bit of a backstory to this, just to make it clear. Uh, a quick point on, on, um, on the benevolent mixing question, which is actually quite intriguing. I would argue it also depends what form of your statehood you're talking about. What's interesting here, and it survives in the 20s, is the whole federalism frame. Let's not forget about that. In many ways, federalism is construed as a way of thinking about and mixing within an interesting form. And that's why studying imperial continuities is interesting here. And and, and, and a point on this, uh, okay, yeah, sure. So, you know, and mixing has different forms. And with regards to Smyrna, what's interesting to me, during the war, during the war in Anatolia in 1922, League of Nations people come in and say, we can manage this in a way by creating some kind of protectorate. This is another form of unmixing. But obviously, the dynamic on the ground is not there. Uh, quick point uh, to, to Michael about, you know, the kind of the Western observer here. And, you know, I, I, I to see, Michael, if you kind of put yourself in that <laughs> genealogy as well. Uh, but we can discuss that, that later. Indeed, the, I, I would argue there's a problem in Greek scholarship. And I, just to put it bluntly, I think even today, Greek scholars cannot really kind of grapple with the terms that whatever way we discuss the imperial venture, the, the venture in Anatolia, it has an imperial dimension. And Greek scholarship is really, really hesitant to kind of come to terms with this, understand it and move on. But I'm moving towards it. Sure. I mean, the, the recent book by Patsy Vasiliou um, and Sirikos is very good, I think. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. And it, you know, it, it moves in the direction of 
looking at the whole scene with unprejudiced eyes. Sure, sure. So, but obviously, up, say up to now, there was this kind of, you know, kind of, and, and if one doesn't think about it as an imperial story as well, then it's difficult to talk about the pain. That's what I write. Then you're back into discussing domestic Greek politics in one way or another. Uh, okay, well, and, and your point often about this, I, I'm not, I, I see your point. I'm not sure I can answer this. Maybe Faisal has to say something about, for instance, you know, moment as traumatic as and how they play out whether they're being discussed or not. So I'll just stop here. Um, Jonathan, regarding your question, what determines em empathy and what determines hostility? Obviously, this is a very complicated question, and I think that there are no linear answers to that. Regarding the Asia Minor refugee population, it seems that there are many variables in play. Some of the most important variables here um, are generation, um, because it seems that we were talking about this refugee identity, Asia Minor refugee identity, and the strong elements of religion, the cultural particularities, the language, the memory of trauma. So it seems that those elements, as I said, to an extent form a community of value and people who don't belong or who doesn't share, uh, who don't share these characteristics automatically became, uh, become, uh, became the other for Asian minor refugees. So we have the emergence of patterns of binary distinctions, hierarchies of acceptabilities, and all of these patterns and um, actually, um, we, we can say that we have the most prominent uh, pattern would be neither hostility nor empathy, but competitive victimization. So it seems that competition is very prominent while referring to these groups, because on the one hand, people want to safeguard their position within the society. And <laughs> on the other hand, um, there is this uh, interchanging idea of who is the established and who is the outsider. So it seems that generation matters because of these uh, key elements that actually shape uh, Asian minor refugee identities. Also, the second thing is that geography matters. And we talk about briefly about regional differences. So if you are in the borders of a country and you perceive yourself because of the way you were put historically in this position as a guardian, then automatically you feel competition or hostility towards people who are coming to destabilize Greece's homogeneity myths about uh, homogeneity and uh, 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 yes. Um, the third component would be the way someone perceives um, uh, their identity. So as I said previously, a minor refugee identity uh, can lead both and equally to the building of bridges, but also to their demolition. So you can have both outcomes. And although this doesn't seem like a very surprising outcome, it actually is because most of the quantitative studies, for example, tend to perceive refugees as one uh, analytical category, while here it seems that in a way some minor refugees and refugees in general are not just one homogeneous category. We're talking about mm -hmm different people, so we cannot group them together. There are different things that we need to take into account, such as the circumstances of their first settlement, uh, the regional, um, their places of origin in Asia Minor, and the way they were integrated into the host society, the degree of their integration and things like that. And very briefly, um, thank you for your question. Uh, I think that the public, the, the, public narrative about the successful story. It wasn't a narrative that it used to be. I think that your question was about national tragedy and its commemoration and memory. So I would say that, um, as you better know, given that you were my supervisor, uh, that memory is very laughing by examples. So it seems like a family marriage. And I'm very privileged and thank you both. Yeah. Uh, so I would say that memory is dynamic and the narrative, the public narrative wasn't that. Uh, and we are starting with a silent point in history with nation states and many similar case studies throughout the world who actually are feel ashamed or embarrassed about uh, their national past. 
this tragic loss, the Asia Minor catastrophe. So we're starting with a silent memory, and this memory passes through the stages of trauma. We have a silent generation, the people who talk in the family sphere, people who talk with their co-invites in the context of the collective sphere, but in the public narrative is different. In the pub public narrative, we have silence and absence, I would say. And then throughout the years, we have multi-directional memories. So there are different things in scenes and shape and reshape identities, other traumas, and throughout time, we have the emergence of the third generation, and it's not a sudden emergence. Uh, we're, I'm referring to this, the post-1974 uh, um, environment in Greece. So we have a democratic shift. Uh, we have different narratives. Uh, and also there is a Holocaust commemoration events and narratives that came into uh, reality. And actually, we have a reawakening of uh, this past narrative, this past silent trauma. So I would say that while considering, I'm not going to fully cover this, uh, this question, but the only thing that I want to say is that while considering questions such as commemoration and trauma, we need to remember that memory is dynamic, memory changes over the years and throughout generations. So generations are important in the context of Greece because of the different events that we have throughout uh, Greece's history. And also we and also and we also need to consider the different levels of memory. We have individual memories that for a long period of time were absent. We have collective memories isolated in specific neighborhoods or refugee settlements. And then we have also a national narrative, a big narrative of society that it seems that it's reawakened at a later stage. So it's not a history with many continuities, but rather with many discontinuities, I would argue. Yes. Do you want to take some more questions? Uh, there are none. So that's it. Um, I, I really have to say I found this absolutely gratifying and highly commendable. I, I really love hearing generations like yours talking about history in a different way. Because when I was doing my work, which was historical now, we didn't look at the context or go backwards or have a continuity. And I think that your three presentations are such an addition to our knowledge of the events around 1922. I would really like to propose that you publish them somehow. Yeah. I think that would be great. Um, well, I thought not only the conceptual history, but the nuanced um, approach to looking at the terms that are used, particularly Marilena, I think you've been very careful about that. And I'm very grateful about it. And I'd just like to point out also mm -hmm. that the term refugee was actually totally inappropriate for these people. They were granted citizenship on arrival. So it was a misnomer from the beginning, <laughs> which in itself is an interesting point. But then it was used, as you pointed out, as a label and an identity, which in my understanding of it, had different dimensions, which were both cultural and political. Um, I have a question, which is um, about Lausanne. Thank you for pointing out that on the 15th of November, they were sitting there thinking, God, what are we going to do? What, what is Lausanne doing about commemorating itself? <laughs> actually, I actually have an answer to that. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> it's very interesting because I'm involved in this project called the Lausanne Project. And, uh, uh, essentially, it's a project of scholars working on the Middle East, uh, uh, which is UK based, but also the Netherlands. But what's interesting is, they are working with the historical museum in Lausanne, who's actually keen to put in an exhibition and kind of, you know, kind of add an element of kind of commemoration to bring that story home there and kind of engage with historians into uh, uh, kind of, you know, rethinking those events. So there's a bit of that going on in the local space, just, just as a side note. And just finally, if you don't mind me saying this, you mentioned the silence at the beginning. And in a way, what's happened with my work, although you've all very kindly acknowledged its contribution, it's a moment frozen in 1970. 
That's the way I understood the situation then. I've been given an opportunity to write another preface to the third edition of the book, in which I've updated as much as I could without having to redo everything. So the book stands as it is, and the preface now, which is quite lengthy, um, has got various insights that I wasn't able to present at the time, and even factual things like the political situation around the resistance in Kokinyao and so on. So it, it, it is going to be some new views on the actual work that I did then. But wait for it, it's only going to be out next year. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, for that, uh, we await your book, uh, and the third edition of your book, with great eagerness. And I just want to close the session by thanking Othon and the European Studies Center for hosting us. And please join me in thanking our three wonderful speakers.